Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Dave's faves. Oh, I have so many faves. I mean, I know you do, too. This is classical music. You know, people don't realize that this is like all of the music that has survived that was composed between the dawn of notation in like the Middle Ages and yesterday if it's written for certain forces which perform classical music. That's a lot of music. That means you can have a lot of favorites. I mean, it depends how open-minded you are, of course. I mean, there are some things that I don't like, but there are a hell of a lot more things that I do. Tons and tons and tons of things that I do. Discovering all of this music has been one of the greatest joys of my life. It's that simple. And so I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to share my range of interests with you and hope that uh, for some of you whose range might be somewhat narrower, if you're curious, it will expand. And I don't know, others, maybe it'll contract, but at least you'll know what's out there. And I think in that sense, it's a, this is a service that I'm delighted to perform. So today, what are we talking about? We're talking about the second Viennese school, Berg, Schoenberg, and Weber. Now, I have individual favorite recordings of many of their works, and I'll be talking about those too. But you know what this is going to be. I mean, this is just a set everyone has to have. Here it is, Herbert von Karajan, three classic albums. It's his second Viennese school set. Now, I've said many times, and most of you have actually agreed with this hypothesis, that one of the great paradoxes of Herbert von Karajan's career is that he wanted to be, you know, the icon the, uh, of the standard German repertoire. You know, the Beethoven, Brahms, those people. And he wasn't. That wasn't where his strengths were. He did some very, very good work in those composers. He really did. I, particularly Brahms, he did quite well. And there's a Beethoven. If you can pick and choose amongst his various Beethoven cycles, of which there are like five or six of them, you can put together a very, very good Beethoven cycle. You really can. He was a very gifted conductor. Make no mistake. However, the really great curry on stuff was in other repertoire, where he could give that other repertoire his own personal treatment, the treatment. The treatment involved glorious string playing, uh, first and foremost. I mean, a, a rather thick sonority, a rather heavy legato, a, tend, a tendency to de-emphasize woodwind sonorities, which I think is a terrible mistake in most music. But, you know, when it worked, it worked extremely well. He could make it work and do fabulous things, especially in Russian music, which is, you know, based on a very rich, yummy string timbre with fabulous brass playing on top when he let the brass do the brass. And in this stuff, the music of the Second Viennese School, it was a revelation. And the reason it was is because, first of all, at the time that he made these recordings, and let's see, what are they? Uh, ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. They have dates. Um, now that's 2014. What are the actual dates of recording? Let's see if they tell us. They really should. Here we go. 1974. So around 1974-ish, 73, and uh, yeah, 73, 74. It, the quality of recording in this repertoire was not that fabulous. It was usually done by modern music specialists with second rate -ish orchestras at least in the early 70s, by, by today's standards. Now, it's played much more frequently by orchestras whose standards are much higher. But back then, it was rare. It was rare repertoire, and everyone hated it, and and Karajan financed these recordings himself. Deutsche Grammophon wouldn't pay for them. He thought they were that important. He insisted on like 30 trillion rehearsals with the Berlin Philharmonic. He really, really got behind it. And like every other artist, great or indifferent or whatever they are, they'll always do better in the stuff they really feel strongly about. He felt really strongly about this. He had a very high standard of, of you know, quality, generally speaking. But there is Carrion on autopilot, and then there is 
Karyan who really cares, and Karyan with conviction. And when he had conviction, he would even violate his own timbral precepts now and again, like letting the woodwinds be heard and letting the percussion come out. And he did those things with music that he felt very strongly about because he actually believed, megalomaniac that he was, and he was, make no mistake, he actually believed that that the music was more important than he was. It rarely happened, but when it did, watch out. You got some great, great results. And for someone who made as many recordings, you know, as he did, it may be that the percentage of things that he deemed more significant than himself was only 10 or 15 percent. But when you make a thousand recordings, that's 100, 150 recordings. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of stuff. So there are some fabulous Karyon recordings, and these are amazing. So let me just tell you what's in it, and that's all we need to know. And you can get off on your own. Go on your own and do it. Schoenberg, okay. Very clear to Nacht, and the variations for orchestra. That was CD1. Now, of course, Fair Clarinet is half an hour of string-only chromatic sludge, and no one did string-only chromatic sludge better than Carion. This is a sludge fest. Glorious, absolutely glorious. Sonority is amazing. It's so thick you may need to, like, you know, have suck on some oxygen while it's playing. And then you've got the Variations for Orchestra, which is one of the weirdest pieces of music ever written, excruciatingly difficult to play, just as difficult to listen to. You can't hear a thing of a variation-type-like sort of thing while it's going on. It has a flexitone. It goes... Very cool. And boy, do they play it. It's amazing. Second disc is Berg, the three pieces for orchestra, which are fabulously horripilating. It's a very scary piece of horror movie music, expressionistic and oh, all sorts of scary things going on. It's wonderful. And then the three pieces from the Lyric Suite, which are also for strings and which are magnificent. And the tone poem by Schoenberg, Pelias und Melisande, which is another big piece of chromatic sludge. Only this is chromatic sludge with winds, brass, and percussion. And this remained for decades, really, the best version with Peleus and Melisande did it, it still holds up extremely well. It really does. I like Peleus and Melisande, I have to tell you. You know, I really, I really do. I mean, it, it, it is, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a particular type of post-Wagnerian romantic excess that's just, it's just fun. It's fun to listen to. Schoenberg, of course, wouldn't have ever said it was fun. Schoenberg was the least fun guy that ever lived. But it really is. It's a wonderful performance. So then we get Webern. Yeah. The Passacaglia, the uh, three movements, op it was five movements. What am I saying? Five movements for strings, opus five. That was the five movements for string quartet, I think, that was orchestrated or one of those things. Yeah, five. The Fünf Zetze, opus five. Here they are. Uh, yeah, for string orchestra, the version for string orchestra. And these six pieces for orchestra, which are really, really good and scary. That's the Webernian equivalent of the Berg three pieces for orchestra. And boy, are they fun. And the symphony for clarinet, bass clarinet, two horns, harp, and strings, which is also gloriously played. I really wish, the only thing that always bothered me, why didn't they do the Schoenberg five pieces for orchestra? That would have been so ideal, because then you would have had the piece pieces I mean, there's another Weber and a bunch of pieces, but still, that would have been just wonderful. But, you know, there were limitations on discs playing, you know, disc side length and whatnot. And beggars can't be choosers. This is still one of the all-time great collections of Second Viennese School, and it comes in this handy three, three cheapy budget, you know, box thing, beautifully packaged, nicely put together. It's a miracle. And it's definitely one of my favorite recordings, certainly for that repertoire, and maybe in a lot of other repertoire too. It's, it's a tribute to what Karian could do when he was sufficiently motivated. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.